Hi, my name is Dr. Emily Deans and this is Evolutionary Psychiatry on YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most popular topics on my blog at Psychology Today, and that's ketones and the brain. The ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, are produced in the body during periods of fasting or very low carbohydrate diets. All of us who are metabolically healthy tend to slip into ketosis overnight. So when you wake up in the morning and your breath's a little bit funky and your urine's kind of dark and maybe a little bit smellier in the morning, you're smelling actually some of the ketones that you produce overnight. This healthy kind of ketosis is perfectly natural. It's very different than what you find in diabetics, which is a diabetic ketoacidosis, which is actually a medical issue that needs to be dealt with quite urgently. But ketosis itself is something we experience all the time. One of the ways to stay in a longer lasting ketosis is to go on a very low carbohydrate diet. So you basically replace all of the starchy carbohydrates in your diet and sugars in your diet with fat. And uh, this has been used a long time to treat epilepsy. And in order to continue to treat that and to study it, they translated the sort of fats um, into these kind of horrible soybean oil-based formulas. And people were having liver problems, kidney problems. These formulas that they used for epilepsy in children were also calorie restricted because they had found that in research, calorie restriction did help with preventing the seizures. A lot of the research on the original ketogenic diets and some of the health problems that were associated with that were related to some of these research diets, which weren't really ideal. And the real life experiment of kind of a modified Atkins, sort of a lower carb Atkins, is a very different thing than some of these original research ketogenic diets. In the diet, in order to make your ketosis easier to maintain and to last longer, you can add what are called medium chain triglycerides or MCT oils. These are metabolized in the liver directly into ketones. So if you add a little coconut oil or just directly the MCT oil to your diet, you can eat a little bit more carbs and have more flexibility and still stay in ketosis. There are also uh, entities called ketone esters. They're quite expensive. Uh, you know, that's another interesting experiment because is it the ketones themselves that might be helpful for health or the brain or something different? Or is it, you know, avoiding processed carbohydrates or many other variables that are associated with a very low carbohydrate diet? So how might a ketogenic diet positively affect the brain? There are lots of theories and none of them are 100% proven, but the first one that's kind of floated, ketogenic diets tend to favor the production of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA as opposed to the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. I'll talk to you more about that in a little bit. Um, the strongest evidence for this is that people on ketogenic diets for seizures have, who are successfully treating their seizures have the highest levels of GABA. In order to understand how more GABA and less glutamate might help the brain, you have to understand sort of the pathology of most uh, brain injury in the first place. And a lot of it is actually very similar, sort of over a different time frame in different areas of the brain. But uh, everything from dementia to migraines to bipolar disorder to seizures uh, to even depression, over time you end up with uh, one of two factors. There is inflammation and then there is something called excitotoxicity. And basically I describe that as just having the positive charges kind of roaring through the membranes, exciting the membranes of this electrical system that is the brain. And uh, it's like having the gas pedal just stuck in the on position. And over a short period of time, the gas pedal stuck on, you end up with the actual electrical short in the brain and that's a, a seizure. Over a longer period of time, you can just kind of end up with lots of buildup, kind of excited toxicity, damage, and destruction. And in various uh, different areas of the brain, again, you'll end up with depression or you will end up with uh, dementia. Reducing that over time just by reducing the entire uh, excited toxic environment to the entire brain may be helpful for the long-term health of the brain. GABA is the neurotransmitter that will turn that excitotoxic signal off. It is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Another theory is that ketogenic diets are also acidic and the ketone bodies themselves are buffering agents in the brain. Um, and they reduce kind of the difference in positive ions on one side of membranes or the other, and so reduce that overall excitotoxicity via just a direct buffering rather than by manipulating the neurotransmitters. 
A third way that ketone or using ketones as fuel in the brain might be beneficial is that they seem to be more efficient in the mitochondria than using glucose. Ketones seem to bypass one of the major uh, fuel depositories in the mitochondria, so they are actually more efficient and end up with fewer free radicals and oxidative particles. And you can kind of see over time using more ketones, you will build up fewer kind of waste products and you can see how again over a long period of time that might be beneficial overall to the workings and of the brain. A more controversial stance is that is ketosis, is it actually the preferred state? Should we all be in ketosis all of the time? I've heard people argue that because the moment that we eat any kind of fruit or sugar or carbohydrate, you're, you're kind of throwing yourself out of ketosis as long as you have enough and certainly our bodies are very much evolved also to run on carbohydrates if we need to. It is interesting though that you don't, there are really no essential carbohydrates per se. We have to have certain fats, we have to have protein in order to survive, but our bodies are built so that if we don't have any carbohydrates available, we can survive and thrive for quite a long time. The major Achilles heel, frankly, of the ketogenic diet may be its effects on the microbiome without as many fibers and um, uh, carbohydrates that you're absorbing. Your microbiome tends to be depleted. Um, it tends to diminish in uh, the different number of species. And those sorts of signals of the microbiome in your gut uh, tend to correlate with poor health. But there's a lot of research that we still need to do. I would say it's really not a risky endeavor for most people to skip breakfast, stay in ketosis a little longer during their day, or even to do a six week or an eight week trial of a ketogenic diet and just see how it affects your energy levels, your activity. Are you someone who thrives on that? Do you not like it? Uh, you do have to give yourself some time to kind of get over those carb cravings and also to metabolically adapt to a fully to a ketogenic diet. So you can't just do it with a, you know, a weak cleanse or something like that. You do need the six to eight weeks. Now, whether it's a great idea to stay in ketosis forever and ever, that's a question we honestly don't know. Certainly if you are treating your epilepsy with a ketogenic, ketogenic diet, uh, certainly, if you are diabetic, you're probably better off. I think most of the literature has come in line with a, a lower carbohydrate diet. Um, but for everybody else, the question's out there. So that's kind of a lot to take in. But if you have questions about ketones in the brain, drop me a comment and I'll try to address it in future videos. And in the meantime, like and subscribe and share uh, if you like this content. This is Evolutionary Psychiatry on YouTube. I'm Dr. Emily Deans and thank you so much.